I'm Aaron Sagers, and this is Talking Strange. Hey there, spooky nerds, and welcome to Talking Strange, a paranormal pop culture show with the Den of Geek Network. As always, I am your host, journalist, a researcher of weird things, host Aaron Sagers, also from 28 Days Haunted on Netflix and Paranormal, caught on camera on Travel Channel and the Max streaming service. And I say to you, season's greetings, or maybe rather season's screamings, because today... We are talking about the ghouls, monsters, and creepy creatures of Christmas. And it is all covered in the new book, The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters. And it is written by Jeff Belanger. And if you have watched any ghost hunting show or read about the paranormal in the last 20 years, it's a solid bet. You, You know who Jeff Belanger is. He's one of the most... Visible and prolific researchers of folklore and legends today. He's a natural storyteller, award-winning, award-winning Emmy-nominated host, writer, producer of the New England Legends series on PBS and Amazon Prime, author of more than a dozen books published in multiple language languages. He also hosts the New England Legends weekly podcast, which has garnered more than 4.5 million downloads since its launch. And it ranks in the top half percent of all podcasts as far as popularity, according to Listen Notes. And some of his bestsellers and also some of my favorite books of his, The World's Most Haunted Places, that's a classic at this point, Weird Massachusetts, Our Haunted Lives, The Call of Kilimanjaro, which I also personally love and is a little bit different and outside of the paranormal realm. And Who's Haunting the White House? And I have to say my earliest kind of interaction with Jeff has to be when uh, ghostvillage.com launched way back in 1999 and became one of the world's most popular paranormal destinations. So without further ado, Jeff Blander, welcome to the show. Hey, Aaron, good to be with you. Thanks for having me. And um, thanks for remembering ghostvillage.com. It was 1999. Think about that. 24 years ago. Yeah. Wow. I mean... Not even Krampus had truly invaded the United States at that point. So you know Krampus. I do. Yeah, he was still uh, very much confined to Austria and Germany. So, mm-hmm. um, yes, welcome Krampus. Good to well, have you with us. First off, man, I have to say I, I have multiple books of yours. And this one I, I think is just gorgeous. It is presented so nicely. We got this nice little uh, bookmark. It's hanging out of it. And some incredible illustrations throughout the book and some classic imagery but i i really like the new illustrations that uh you're presenting in the book this is just so well done my friend i mean just personally how how do you feel about how this book turned out yeah i'm thrilled so when um this whole thing was born 10 years ago when i was first asked to give a talk on Krampus, and i said oh you know i've been sort of meaning to look into him and and then it evolved into like an annual talk and then Um, publisher approached me a couple of years ago and said, Hey, we think this should be a book. And I said, yeah, I do too. I've been meaning to get to it. Um, But they're like, like a gift book, something special, but something that stands out. And I said, yeah, I'm listening. It's funny. Everybody mentions the bookmark, um, but, and I'm going to point something out and you'll say, Oh yeah, right. So the bookmark is, is one of, you see that it's one of those sewn in bookmarks, but it's supposed to be Krampus's forked red tongue at the end. Oh, Ah, that was yeah. the idea. That was not my idea. That was Michael Pye at the publisher. But he said, yeah, we're going to have the bookmark in there. But the fork to be like the forked red tongue. Nobody got it. But I still love to point it out because I mean, it still works as a bookmark, whether you recognize it or not. But no. So so as it started to come together, uh, I was working with a, a great designer and and we, we agreed like we want it to look like Dickensy, like old. And we want lots of great old images and postcards and as much as we can to just sort of give it that feel. And, but, but to, for me, the story was the compelling part. And at the end of the day, all I was trying to do was just save Christmas for myself from ruin, you know, from thinking of it as this like over commercialized, horrible thing. And back to when I was a kid, when it was a drug that I was high on. Yeah. You open the book talking about when you're hanging a wreath and of course you have uh, a daughter, you have a kid. I think she was a little bit younger at that point when you had that experience and drop the wreath, 
live out, let out a few expletives that are uh, not Christmas friendly, I guess. And uh, that kind of inspired you to go on this path. And I appreciate that. I appreciate this being sort of your pursuit, a very personal pursuit, but also kind of connecting in a, gl- a larger scale with the season. But I want to I want to go back a little bit more than that, because when was your first awareness of sort of this scary side or creepy side of the season? When I was young, I, I love Christmas. I still love Christmas carols, but I, I loved them as a kid, too. And I remember Andy Williams. There'll be scary ghost stories and tales of the glories of Christmases long, long ago. I never had scary ghost stories. Uh, at first pass, anyway, when I first thought about it, I'm like, we never had scary ghost stories growing up. We didn't sit around and tell scary ghost stories. Uh, of course, there was one that we just sh- look right past because I think it's so omnipresent that we just it's just part of the background at this point. But of course, Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol is a scary ghost story that's been told for, you know, almost a century, almost two centuries, going on two centuries now. And so um, but it, for the most part, I never thought of it as a scary time. But that, that always sort of like batted around in my head uh, until Krampus, thanks to the Internet, of course, started to get mentioned around outside of Germany and Austria. And uh, a friend told me about him. And, and years ago, he's like, have you heard of this Krampus character? And I went, oh, my gosh, this is amazing. And started looking into it and always wondered, like, well, why did he go away? And why are we finding out about him now? Other than you can always blame the Internet that cool things can be timeless, right? Something from long ago makes it to the internet. I send it to you, you send it to someone else. We post it, it gets reposted and suddenly people resonate with it and what's old is new again. And then once he got a movie deal in 2015, well, that's that. Like once you get movie deals, you go in mainstream. So um, so I, I think Krampus is kind of here to stay. But yeah, it was. it's just, you know, when you look for the dark side of stuff, I always knew Christmas was about Yule, was about the winter solstice. I mean, I knew that just from, you know, paranormal studies and folklore studies, but I had no idea just how dark it went um, until I really started to dig in. Yeah. And I mean, for me, I remember first, I think writing about Krampus, probably like eh, 2007, 2008, maybe. And, and then, yeah, it just seemed like it, people kind of glommed on to it. And then the movie came out at that right time to both kind of bolster that growing popularity and it, it was both responding to it and then bolstered it, I, I would argue. Always, yeah. And what do you think of the movie? What, what did, like one to 10? I, so I actually just rewatched it the other day with yeah. uh, a group of folks. And I think it's probably like a seven or eight. I think it's really fun. I think it's both, for me, it, it, it captures that sort of classic Gremlins feel of it's not mean spirited, but it doesn't hold back. Right. And yeah, yeah, and ultimately, not to spoil anything, but it begins with a family not wanting to be together, and it really is about a family staying together. It, it's uh, I agree with you. I agree with you on the number, and I, but I also recognize that I am not a fair person to ask because I was just so happy to see him in a movie that it could could have been like a polka musical, and I would have been like, "Yay, Grandpa's right." So, <laughs> so I'm not a good, uh, I'm not an objective gauge on this one, but I loved it, and I've watched it again, and. Um, and I, and I love that they caught the spirit of what Krampus is supposed to be, but anyway, go on. I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, no. Yeah. And actually it kind of on, on that note, like, well, let me go back to the Andy Williams thing. So yeah, I, I remember that lyric before I ever really thought about the lyric and, and it just kind of bounced around in my brain for a while in your research. And obviously I want to cover a bunch of other stuff, but in your research, Andy Williams, well, I, I don't think it was actually written by Andy Williams, but no, it, it was, uh, I think, two, I think, ironically enough, Jewish uh, uh, lyricists, I believe. Um, Probably. <laughs> but was there ever any comment on, well, wait, why the scary ghost stories, Andy? Like, where's that coming from? So I think by that point, and I, I, forgive me if I got the date wrong, I want to say 1962 was, uh, was that song? I believe song? so. It was like early to mid-60s. Yeah. So I think that was that was roughly the ballpark. So um, when that song came out, um, Christmas Carol, from the time it was published in the 1840s until right this minute, uh, it's never gone away, right? It's uh, arguably only gotten bigger. And so that was still true in the 60s. Um, so that was probably in his head. But if whoever wrote it, I mean, if they talked to some old timers in the 60s who remember growing up in the 20s or, or teens or whatever, 
uh, Victorian uh, Christmas ghost stories was still a thing. Women's magazines would publish them yeah. to read around the fireplace at Christmas. So if you talk to old timers at that time, they might have had that in their childhoods, even though it was mostly going away. That that um, that trend was mostly going away by the 1960s. I think the song was trying to cash in on the nostalgia of the past, which is what you always do when you're trying to cash in on something Christmassy. You put it out brand new and remind everybody that this has been around forever. It's actually is nostalgic, which is impossible. You can't be nostalgic with something brand spanking new, right? Like here's a widget. I just made it four seconds ago. But if I put a Christmas bow on it, there's something nostalgic about it. You don't even know why. And and that's what they were doing with that song. And then it gets played year after year after year. And we breeze right by it. You know, we breeze right by that line, unless you're paranormal folks like us. And you go, wait a minute, what ghosts? And then yeah. you start digging. Yeah, I, uh, it, it is. I mean, kind of another thing is, and you mentioned it in the book, is we did have our pop culture Krampus as a kid. And then our parents did too, in the form of the Grinch. Who, the Grinch, yeah. Who lives on what Mount Crumpet, very similar to Krampus. And you know, there, yeah. there's there's a, a nomenclature there, it seems like there's related. Again, I don't think I don't think uh, Dr. Seuss was really ever on record talking about Krampus. No, and there's even a there's a, a point in the cartoon which I love where the Grinch doesn't have horns, but there's one point where his, his fur goes into these curly little things. And you're just like, oh, I, I to me, that was just a tip of the hat. Like, OK, I, I acknowledge I'm completely ripping off this uh, this monster. Um, but yeah, no, Krampus was there. He just went by the name of the Grinch. But we got it that there's this monster. However, as we know, the Grinch is not was just angry at Christmas because he was lonely and angry at people that celebrated Christmas. Krampus, I don't think, hates Christmas. He's, it's when he's most useful. <laughs> he's literally yeah. serving a, an important purpose. Yeah, he has a job to do. And yeah. something something you talk about in the book, which I love, and, and there's even a great illustration of it or a postcard that we've there's this notion that Krampus is sort of the anti clause as far as the the bad guy. And then Santa comes along and saves the day. But that's that's kind of more of a modern interpretation. Of, yeah. Well, it's all, I guess, relatively modern but it's more of a recent interpretation of the krampus santa claus duo right 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 and and the movie you, i guess we could blame the movie a little bit although if and again i don't want to spoil it although by now you really should have seen it it's what eight years old but um the the movie sort of implies that that krampus comes to take not give and that's true that was true historically and at the same time uh, yeah, there he is. They are cohorts. They're not enemies. Uh, put it to rest. There are many, many postcards that show them arriving together and happy little children are running up to St. Nicholas and other kids are scared and hiding under the table because they know Krampus is there for them. It's just good cop, bad cop. I mean, that's it. That's that's what these two are. And they both have jobs to do. They both have serve a role. And we dropped the monsters around the 1920s is when was when we've started pushing them way back into the dark recesses of the holiday but forever they were just omnipresent um this was a time to be scared this is a time for monsters um a scary frightening season winter uh all the things out there that could literally kill you and saint nicholas comes along with them as cohorts and it is now time for another installment of the segment we call creepy collectibles and curios Creepy collectibles and curios. Still working on that jingle. But this part of Talking Strange is where I recommend stuff for you to buy, which is really stuff that I want to buy. And with that in mind, I was thinking about Bernie Wrightson and Swamp Thing. I love Swamp Thing and I love the artistry of Bernie Wrightson, who was the co-creator of Swamp Thing along with Len Wein, both of whom sadly passed away in 2017. Now, Bernie was also active in the classic creepy and eerie horror comics. And in 2011, Dark Horse Comics published a collection of Bernie's work. If you know anything about Bernie Wrightson, you automatically recognize his artistry because his line work was insanely detailed. And he not only drew beautiful monsters, but he drew them with soul. And his art remains, quite frankly, unparalleled. 
And it makes it no surprise to me that directors like Guillermo del Toro or comic book creator Mike Mignola list Bernie as such a hero and rock star of the comic book world. He was. He was indeed. So this, uh, which we found on eBay, is Creepy Presents Bernie Wrightson. And this is the hardcover Dark Horse book of his work. And it's signed by Bernie. And... The book was signed by Bernie at a Comic-Con, acquired by the seller, and it arrives in great condition. Sure enough, I am placing a bid on it to have a little piece of comic book history on hand. Now, it's not original copies of Bernie's work, but that's kind of hard to find. So this is a way for me to bring the genius home. The starting bid on this was 50 bucks, and you better believe I did bid on it. So if you missed this one, there are still other signed works by Bernie out there so check it out on ebay and scoop it up the you also uh, a lot of the book it's as you as the uh subhead it subtitle is that uh you're surviving other yuletide monsters and you go into a lot of them and there there are a lot but we have <laughs> the dysfunctional family of uh Grilla and the yule lads and the yule cat and you know all of these guys kind of operate with extreme prejudice as far as if you don't follow the appropriate rituals or don't keep your house nice and tidy you might get eaten yeah yeah uh, iceland doesn't mess around uh and what i what i love about grilla is that she is uh she's a mountain ogre a troll with like you know 13 tails and she lives up in the mountains unlike krampus who you're only you only have to worry about krampus if you're naughty if you're a good kid don't sweat it you're gonna be fine right um like the cops say, I won't pull you over if you don't speed. <laughs> you know, don't run yeah. red lights. You'll be fine. Uh, so, so Grilla though doesn't discriminate. Anyone caught outside around the winter solstice on a dark and stormy, scary, cold night, you could end up in her stew and eaten. And I think parents are probably pretty adept at telling the story of the Grilla in Iceland because if you think about it, around the winter solstice. Uh, there's only about four hours of sunlight in Reykjavik. If you go further north, it's less. Uh, if yeah. you go all the way to the northern tip of Iceland, you're just about at the Arctic Circle. You know, there's, there's hardly any daylight at all. And that's the time when the the elemental creatures, the trolls, the monsters, and the, the imps and fairies all come down from the mountains and take what's theirs. They, they collect their rent. And it's a time for us humans to stay inside, stay safe, um, you know, look out for each other, stay warm. And if you go outside in the dark you know, you're, you're literally risking your life. Yeah. It's, it's the moral of the story of, of, of all the stories out there. It's uh, don't go do this because bad things will happen. And if we have to say it's due to some supernatural force, so be it. If it, if it saves your butt and saves the kids from wandering too close to the, to the water or whatever, or to a cliff yep. side. But also we have like with Yule Cat, this, this notion of charity is kind of baked in throughout uh, these monsters and these monstrous yeah. tales that you sure it's it's probably a good thing for you to open up your homes to your neighbors occasionally because when things go south you're going to need them to back you up and then you have this notion of the yule cat that he his whole deal is that if you're wearing old clothes he's going to eat you right right <laughs> which which is funny because that's that's one of the earliest references i found to tying Christmas with consumerism a little bit. You know what I mean? So uh, let's face it, you know, like I, you can get angry about the consumerism part of Christmas, but you know, what's good for the economy is good for all of us to some degree. You know, if 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 people are spending and the economy is good, that trickles to all of us. So, um, so you, you can't blame someone for saying, you better have new clothes. You better show that you've worked hard enough, that you're not lazy and that you have earned the money to buy new clothes for yourself and for your family. And you should, of course, wear them on Christmas Day. And if you don't, the Yule Cat will come along and kill you and eat you. And <laughs> which is great. I've, of course, I've also, right. I've also heard that like with the Yule Cat, that part of it, and I don't know if this was a later kind of introduction to it, that, okay, well, with your old clothes, you donate those to those to people that are less fortunate. So then you have that charity element in as well. In every single story I found, there is some undertone of looking out for each other too, right? So um, whether that's behaving better, giving to others, helping others, opening up your hearts and your homes, there's always this undertone of it's dangerous out there and you cannot get through this alone. So, you know, you, you better watch out, <laughs> you yeah. better help. 
in the the course of this book, and I know you've been giving a presentation on on sort of the the Christmas monsters for a while, but what was something during this specific research process that you discovered that was new to you? It really kind of kind of yeah added a added a whole new element of perspective to the seasons and the and the creatures out there. So I was raised Catholic in the interest of full disclosure. And I, I think it's important to say that just I went through the whole thing, confirmation, the whole bit. Same. And I, yeah, it's, I remember growing up with I, I loved Christmas, absolutely loved Christmas. And like I said, it was a drug from Thanksgiving dessert through the ball dropping on New Year's Eve. I was just buzzing high. Right. And you get older and that gets less and less. And then eventually, you know, sadly, a lot of it mostly goes away. Um I, I was always told, you know, Christmas is the birth of Jesus and that's his birthday. And that's why it's such a cause for this enormous celebration, biggest celebration of the year. I mean, that, and that's not my opinion. That's that's the, you know, check the numbers. You know, the economy depends on this holiday. And, you know, I, I would put up Christmas lights and wreaths and trees and garland around the trees and all this other stuff. And what surprised me was how absolutely none of these symbols, not a one, was Christian in origin. Um, all of them are pagan, all of them come from other festivals that were sort of incorporated, and that Jesus was most certainly not born on December 25th. And in fact, in most of Christianity, his birthday was never really considered a big deal, because that's not what defines Christianity. Christianity is not defined by the birth of Jesus. Christianity is defined by Easter, by the death and resurrection. That's what makes you a Christian, that you believe in the, that he died and he was resurrected. Everyone's born. All of us are born. Um, but to die and come back, you know, nobody does that. So, so, so really, uh, Christianity has been at war with this holiday right up until really modern times. And then I thought back to Father Lawler. Father Lawler was my priest when I was about six years old. And I remember it was December and we were all in the church hall and Santa was coming to give us all gifts. And in walks Santa. And he's got candy canes for all the kids and little wrapped presents. And in each one is little plastic rosary beads for each kid. And we're losing our minds. We're like, it's Santa. Santa just walked in. And Father Lawler is standing there in the corner, arms crossed in front of him, looking absolutely furious, trying to shoot laser daggers out of his eyes to make Santa's head explode. And I'm looking at him and I'm like, what's wrong with you? That is literally the greatest guy on earth. That's Santa Claus. What is wrong with you, Father Lawler? That dude's bigger than Jesus. Oh. Oh, right. Oh, maybe. Maybe that's it. <laughs> he knew he knew none of this had anything to do with christianity and it just pissed him off to his very core um and that was true for all of of christianity until very recently only the last few decades have they started to sort of like truly conquer the holiday you know jesus is the reason for the season it can be and by the way i'm not trying to be anti-christian at all i mean if you want to you could celebrate the birth of jesus any day you want you can you know december 25th is as good as any other but um, none of the roots come from that. And in fact, Jesus was, if Jesus's birthday was important, it would have got more ink in the Bible. It gets almost none, just that he was born and, and shepherds lay out in their fields, keeping watch over their flock by night, which means in Bethlehem, you know, the only season you can rule out where he was born is winter because <laughs> they only stayed out all night in the spring, summer, and fall. So there's that, it's... but yeah. I mean, it, and it speaks to, and I, and, and you talk about it in the book and I think it just, it's not devaluing Christmas as a no. Christian holiday. It's however, connecting the dots to sort of the cross-cultural stories where we, and also kind of speaks to the great marketing machine of the church that they knew, oh, you know, we really want to sell, we want to sell our, our message why not piggyback on these other rituals and holidays that are already taking place? And, yeah. and honestly, like it did continue, I think into our childhoods because Easter is the bigger deal. That is, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the actual important one as far as Christianity. And yet as kids, I think it was like, okay, Lent, all right. You know, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. We, we get some, give something up. some chocolate, give some stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. But man, Christmas was prime time. That was yeah. that was what made me a good a good little Catholic boy. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Like I mean, and then the the threats you got all through like November, December, right? Santa's watching, and you're like, okay, okay, right, right, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll behave, right? N never once during the spring was were, were mom and dad like the Easter Bunny's watching. 
It was Lent. You know how many, look, I don't mean to throw the word like martyr or hero around, but you know how many 40 days I went without bubble gum? <laughs> you know what I mean? And here we are. And then I would right. get chocolate and bubble gum and I'd be like, oh, I can have gum. And now I'm going to heaven. So, which is great. I got that going for me. Um, but, but yeah, no, Easter was supposed to be the big one, but you know, I, again, you can check the scoreboard and by scoreboard, I mean, you know, where do people spend their money on holidays? Christmas is number one. Halloween is number two Easter. I don't even know if, if that's above, well, it's probably above 4th of July, but barely, right? Like, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a distant third at best. Um, so yeah, so it was, if that one doesn't get the, the attention, and yet this one does. And so I guess if I was in charge of Christianity, which I can't stress enough that I'm not. <laughs> that not with that attitude, even, Jeff. They won't even return my calls. You know what I mean? Um, uh, I get it. You want to, if this is where we get the attention, let's cash in. Hey, I'm a paranormal guy. You're a paranormal guy. You know that uh, all the media, all the world calls in October. We get that month to talk about our favorite subject, a subject we're interested in all 12 months of the year. But in October, we get the stage. And so uh, we take advantage and we, we get this as an opportunity to talk about the things we do all year round. And hopefully other people get interested and stay with it, you know, past October. So I get it. I get it. Um, whoever's in charge of the PR is is doing a hell of a job for sure. It's kind of interesting because the, uh, as you said, the, there is a, a partnership between Jesus and Santa, I guess, during the holidays, as far as which one is the lead singer and which one is the guitarist as far as who's getting better billing. But it is, it almost for me as a kid, Santa watching all the time was both exciting, but also scary sure. or, or his helpers, which does not make it less scary, but in a way the Krampus Santa dichotomy works better because you're not worried about the good guy watching you and also punishing you. There's a whole other dude out there so it it kind of makes more sense to be afraid of that guy but just love that guy absolutely well uh, i worked on a story on uh part one of the chapters is on Père futar in france yeah and Père futar means father whipper and for those who don't know his backstory is one of saint nicholas's many attributed miracles probably the wildest one and how it hasn't been made into a movie yet i don't know but um so three children are lost in a snowy you know, night and they find this little hut in a village with a light on and they go in and it's the butcher shop and the butcher shop is completely empty and the butcher's in there and they say, can can we please take shelter for the night? Can you you know, help us till morning till we find our parents? And he says, sure, why don't you come in the back? And that's when he kills all the children, cuts them up into meat, puts the meat into salting tubs and puts the meat out for sale. And St. Nicholas happens by and his spidey senses start tingling and he goes inside and he looks at this Christmas cannibal. And he said, and he looks at the meat and he knows not only what it is, he knows who it is. And he's able to reconstitute the children back together again. And they'll be fine after decades of therapy, I assume. And then he looks at this butcher and says, no more Christmas cannibal. From now on, you're Père Futar, you work for me, your father whipper, and you will whip the naughty kids. Fast forward to literally uh, a week ago. And um, <laughs> uh, December 6th is St. Nicholas Day. I was interviewing a French school teacher who teaches uh, preschool and, and like kindergarten over in northern France. And she was telling me, she's like, when I was a kid, uh, Père Futar, who's, who's, by the way, covered in like a brown cloak, all black beard. You can't even see his face. He carries a switch of sticks. If you saw him walking down the alley, you absolutely would turn tail and run. No question. And then she said, you know, Père Futar and St. Nicholas arrived together and you never knew which one was there for you right? Like they're both coming right at you. They sit in front of the classroom. And I said, wow, that must have been so emotionally scarring, but at least you don't do that anymore. And she's like, oh, no, yeah, we do. Here's a picture of my classroom. And she sends me this picture. And you see the backs of these little five-year-olds sitting on blue mats, you know, on the floor. And then there's there's St. Nicholas and Père Futar sitting side by side. And Père Futar has got the sticks and his face is completely black with a beard. And I, I, I just put my mind back to little five-year-old Jeff. I would be petrified. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know which one is here for me. Is it the bad guy who's going to like beat me or is it the good guy who's going to reward me? And that is so much more powerful than Santa walking in going, well, little Jeff, you know, I mean, you've been pretty good. I'll bring you a few things. <laughs> maybe maybe not that Xbox this year, but, you know, a few things. And uh, it, it just the it's so, so powerful, that image. But um, and it's still I, very, very much around. And I, I have to say, I don't know anyone that at least in the U.S. that 
there was follow through on the lump of coal or not getting presents. Everybody is a, a nice kid. But when you have this other straight up like cannibal or demonic looking creature, that threat follows through a little bit more. Absolutely. Uh, you know, what's interesting, though, the other night I was given a talk on this and uh, an old timer was telling me the story. He said when he was growing up, there was always coal in his stocking. He said the, the stocking was the present and there would be like some coins, like change, you know, money. And then like maybe like an orange, maybe like a little little gift, a toy or something like that. But there'd be coal, too. And it was literally a thermometer of how good you were this year. If it was like 50% coal, you you were viewed as 50% bad. If it was like 70% coal, if it was, you know, if you were 20% coal, you were just a little bad. And so literally his his family showed him how he did well, by how much coal, all the kids, all the kids always had some coal in the stocking because none of them were perfect all year. That was probably unique to that family. I'd never heard that before, but I love it. I was like, what a great, because no kid is perfect all year. We all mess up, you know, uh, but no kid is all rotten all year either, you know? So I love that you were lit literally like, so let's see how you did this year. Here's your stocking. And you're like, Ooh, it's a lot of coal. Sorry about the car, you know, <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it was a, it was a literal thermometer. Without, I mean, throughout all of these stories, what really strikes me is one, there's, a, there is an obsession with eating children. I mean, yes, uh, Grilla does it, uh, you know, Krampus in some stories will drag you back to hell and uh, Pierre Furtard was cannibal. And I, I, one of them, I, I don't know if it was Grilla or there's another Christmas witch that if you don't follow her rituals, she'll like eat your stomach and stuff you full of stones and straw or whatever. Um, I forget which one she is, but that's one element. And the other is that Santa's really not great with his judgment of employees because he hires a lot of he kind of pals around with a lot of dodgy people like meeting yeah. the cannibal and being like, you know what? You're working for me now. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah, you're right. And and um, and he even took in a slave. Um, right. Uh, right. Uh, Zwarte Piet, Black Peter over in the Netherlands, the Dutch slave trade. I mean, he. He took a slave. Um, what the story is, he rescued this kid, uh, basically purchased him uh, so he wouldn't be sold as a slave and then was his slave. So I you know, like it was it's it's hard to get around the fact that and I understand there's different interpretations of Black Peter, but like it's hard to get around the fact that it was very much an enslaved person. Uh, absolutely. Even absolutely. There's the evolution of that now and protest and whatnot. And the United States played a role in that. I mean, this was the that book came out in the 1850s and the Dutch slave trade was alive and well. And their single biggest customer was the United States. So once the Civil War ended and slavery was abolished in the U.S., the slave trade really you know, bottomed out and the Dutch had to sort of basically do away with it, too. But that story persevered. And it's inherently racist because for many, many years, Black Peter's portrayed as a white person in blackface in the, the various um, parades and stuff. And there's there's no way like in, the, in this modern time, you can't say like, well, sure, he's wearing blackface, but there's nothing you can say after but. Right. There's no there's no but. It's just it's it's not OK. And uh, the Dutch are struggling with that. They're struggling with that. He still shows up in Christmas parades. There's protests. There's neo Nazis on one side, Nazi saluting Black Peter. That's just never what the holiday was supposed to be about. And so they they sort of developed Shorstan Piet, which is uh, chimney Pete. He's just yeah, covered in soot from going down the chimney, and that that's not racist. That's just a dirty person. And but it's not catching on because it doesn't have you know 170 years plus of uh, tradition behind it. Um, so anyway, it's it's interesting to see how countries struggle with their monsters and um and and how to like incorporate them or drop them or what, what do we do uh tradition is a tough thing you know when something is a tradition people will just die on the hill for it and we know that we see it in our own culture you know and yet evolution does happen with these folk stories and legends and so black peter is in the process of evolving right now and yep. and these they've been trying to evolve him for a while and we see that even going back a hundred years where, you know, the, all of these things kind of existed and some of them were slowly making their way to the United States. And then you have like Washington Irving, the, the evolution of Christmas from Washington Irving to Charles Dickens to to what we know as Santa Claus and Christmas to this day. Really, the U.S. did kind of have a, a hand in this formation towards Dickens. Huge hand. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Huge, huge hand. Um, I think it's fair to say Charles Dickens invented Christmas, like truly, like our notion of what it's supposed to feel like. Not the yeah. day or anything like that, but like what it's supposed to feel like where family comes together, you eat a turkey. Uh, he did more for the poultry business when that book came out than any other human on earth. Right. And because um, it was always a goose. And then it started to be a turkey based on that that story. And um, so, yeah, uh, th there's, of course, an evolution in the in the rest of the world, it's mainly Europe. Uh, December 6th is St. Nicholas Day. That's when mm -hmm. St. Nicholas brings the present presents. We never really had St. Nicholas Day in this U.S. In the U.S., it wasn't that big, but we had Christmas Day. And the Dutch bring, of course, uh, Sinterklaas over to New Amsterdam, which is now, of course, New York. And uh, he got associated with December 25th, the, you know, the, you know, the, which Constantine decreed way back when, right. but, it, you know, so, so December 25th became his day and Sinterklaas evolved into Santa Claus and became such a huge figure that suddenly Europe has St. Nicholas on December 6th and Santa Claus on December 25th. So, you know, the holiday, the American influence, uh, just like with Halloween, Halloween was very much an American invention, not not the Celtic celebration of Samhain, but, you know, the, the trick or treating and the costumes and all that stuff. And then it's spread because it's fun. Uh, and it's 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 a great time. And so I think the same thing happened with with Christmas. You know, once it got big over here, once Charles Dickens brought it over after the Civil War started, you know, his his story wasn't big. Christmas wasn't big here. But post Civil War, he started reading it. People started consuming it. And suddenly people were getting the day off from work for Christmas Day. And then it became a federal holiday. And eventually Thanksgiving was moved to the fourth Thursday of the month. So retailers had more time to shop. And then once it turned into consumerism, then all the monsters had to go away. There was no place for them in a world where it's got to be happy and bright and merry and spend, spend, spend and buy, buy, buy. Um, we, we can't have anything uh, scaring you into consequences. We have to absolutely keep it focused on the money, which is too bad. But I, I you know, too, like in the last decade or two, uh, they're coming back. They're coming back mm -hmm. because we're bringing them back because movies and, and you know, Netflix and books and everything else is bringing these stories back. We're demanding them. We're, we're missing them. And I think they speak to a really primal part of us. Have you thought about, you know, the so when Dickens was younger, he, he read the Washington Irving um the uh, accounts from a, a English countryside Christmas and in that, one of those characters is telling a story, ghost stories around uh, the fire at Christmas Eve. And he actually tells a story about fairies. And then later on, pre-Christmas Carol, Dickens writes the goblins that stole a sexton, right? Mm -hmm. And that's all about goblins. You ever played the what if game of like, what if that was the Dickens tale that had gotten bigger and instead it's Christmas goblins instead of the Christmas ghost stories? You never. Well, so it's important to point out too. Dickens was not the first nor the last to write a Christmas ghost story. Oh no! Right? It, it was a it was a long tradition over in England. Uh, he just he had a banger, right? He had a hit. He had a hit song, and it blew up bigger than than everybody else's. Um, and there there were great ones that came mm -hmm. years and years after his, and people kept trying their hand at it. So, I, I mean, timing um, the a perfect storm of an you know industrial revolution meeting the haves and the have nots and a reminder of that we have to look out for each other. That's how Santa Claus got so big. The the gap between the haves and the have nots was really growing in this country. And and Christmas became a steam valve. And one of the analogies I like to use for people is that, you know, if you've ever worked for a company that gives you a year end bonus, um, think about, you know, I used to I'm not spent a long time, but like, you know, if that year end bonus was big enough or impressive enough, however you deem that to be impressive, you would forgive a whole year of abuse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You'd suddenly be, I mean, you hated that job right up until like mid December. And then you get this bonus and you're like, that's ah, not so bad. I mean, that's pretty sweet. That's going to pay some bills and we can maybe go on vacation and then I'll, I'll see you in January. Okay. Which by the way, is what the holiday was always about. When you go all the way back to Saturnalia, it was a steam valve on society. It was this week right about the end of December where you could turn everything on its ear where you would, the, the rich would give to the poor. They would serve their servants. The servants could get away with saying and doing stuff that they could never get away with the rest of the year. We would make merry and feast and party like there was no tomorrow. 
Um, and then after all that was over, you'd say, all right, all right, you're not so bad. I guess we'll, we'll come back to work in January. So it's, uh, it's always been a steam valve still is, you know, to, to some degree. Um, mm-hmm. and, and that's, um, th- those roots sort of shine through, even though we've called them different things now and we paint it with a different veneer, but it's still there. Well, even Christmas Carol really has sort of these almost pagan ideas in them, because when we think about the ghosts, Marley's ghost is a traditional ghost, even though the spirits are kind of streaming across the sky in a way that's sort of evocative of the wild hunt, right? And then Mm -hmm. the ghost of Christmas past is presented very much as this sort of ethereal flame. And then we have this kind of paganistic ghost of Christmas uh, present and then yet to come is like death, the embodiment of death. So even with that, they're not really the 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 boo kind of ghost that we tend to think of no of course and and i think marley's ghost is the one that doesn't get talked about enough you know like he's he's literally damned he's covered in chains and cash boxes chains he forged in life and he comes before scrooge and he says to him look i died seven christmas eves ago this very night and your chains were just as long as these seven christmases ago and you have toiled on your chains ever since it is a ponderous chain but but Scrooge, I've arranged something for you. My procuring, he says, I have made this happen. You are going to be haunted. And if you get through this, you have a chance. And what I love about this, and it's a, a, a theme that kept coming up again and again, is that the only way we can see the light is if we get to a dark place. You've got to get down there. You've got to face your ghosts, your demons. You've got to get down to a deep place dark, scary, frightening place before you're willing to make some changes. Think about anyone you've ever known that had a real health scare, like a heart attack. And they're like, oh, I've been eating way too much sugar and whatever fats and or whatever, whatever it is that they're like, I got to make some changes. I don't want to die. Right. So that scare that scares you into making changes. The beautiful thing about that story, what made it so appealing is that, number one, by the end of the story, when Scrooge is on his knees looking at his grave, and knowing that he's going to die and no one's going to care. Uh, and then he he sees the light, right? He has this epiphany. I, I can change everything. My heart is lighter. I'm going to give. I'm going to help out Bob Cratchit. I'm going to be a different person starting right this very second. That he could do all that in one night. And then we realize who Scrooge is in the story. We go, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. I know who Scrooge is. He's me. I'm Scrooge. That's the book was about me the whole time. I had no idea, right? This This story that was written so long before I was born. It's about me getting older and crankier. And if he can change in one night, maybe I could too. And that is really appealing, you know, for all of us that we can wake up completely different tomorrow. Um, And we can, but only if we get to a deep, dark, frightening place. These monsters gifted us with that. The seasonality of the, the longest night and the shortest day gifts us with that. Winter coming and threatening us is a gift that reminds us that we are all facing down the barrel of a gun. And the only way through it is going to be to look out for each other. Charity, neighborly, you know, make amends with family and friends and get through this together. And when we get to that dark place, we can maybe be the person we want to be on the other side. Then come the spring, we can get back to arguing again. And, (laughs) you know, (laughs) it is the ultimate scared straight story. It is. Yeah, right. And, and yeah, so we see that a lot and and also kind of relates to the notion of one day of fasting leads to penance and then you can reboot and right. start fresh. The Well, then I guess, do you think it's the darkness? Well, I guess my question is why now? Why do you think that there is this popularity now in sort of the counter programming of Christmas celebrating the monsters and it's not always because it's teaching us a moral lesson it's because it's a good time to party and get drunk but also yeah we're celebrating the darkness and instead of the candy cane sweetness all the time is it do you think it is counter programming to push off to push against people that are trying to dictate how to celebrate christmas is it a natural extension of halloween as spooky season as a lifestyle is it an increasing amount of secularism. What the why now question? Yeah, so I I think I can answer that. So earlier you had mentioned how all these monsters eat children, right? Like that was and that was the story from way back. Uh, think about all the old grim fairy tales. <laughs> all the grim fairy tales ate children. That's how stories were back then. Um, 
kids could take that. They could understand that you would literally cut your toes off to try to fit into the glass slipper and fill it with blood. That's how important it was before Disney got their hands on it, right? So all that went away. We made it all so saccharine sweet. And the world was supposed to just be safe and predictable. And now we live in a time, especially with so much access to information and news and social media and all these different messages coming at us all the time, that we're scared. We are scared already that we're we're swimming in a sea of chaos. We always have been, by the way. It's just more prevalent now. You can just you can just see it, you know, uh, more clearly because of, of the internet and, and the influence that has. So when we're scared, we go primal. You, when you're afraid, you cannot use the uh, thinky part of your brain. I don't mean to get all technical on everybody, mm. but you can't use the cerebral part of your brain when you are frightened. You, you're in fight or flight. And when these, these monsters offer us a perfect metaphor, because monsters are real. We know that. There's no question. We see them do horrible things, shooting up schools and you know, you name any manner of evil, um, there are monsters out there. The worst thing about those monsters, though, the very worst thing is that they look just like us. You can't tell them apart. If you saw something with horns and covered in chains and, blah, you know, strolling down the street, you'd know to avoid that. It's the ones that don't look like that that really, you know, scare us. And so I think we're bringing them back to remind us that there is danger out there and they become the perfect metaphor for that. And it's time to bring back the scary part of the season. It's it's a collective conscious thing. There's You can't name any one thing, but I suspect that, sure, Halloween getting bigger and bigger, you know, growing into such a huge holiday in the last 20, 30 years that people are like, hey, it's kind of fun to embrace this darker side. And then realizing that like, oh, there, there's a darker side to, to Christmas too. I've got this great uh, thing I bought from a little craft shop, you know, and it's, um, it, it shows the the year as a, as a wheel, you know, and and the idea is that th this there's four major holidays all around the world: winter, spring, summer, fall, and then halfway between them, the half holidays are important too. So Halloween, Samhain, is the sunset of the year. Midnight, midnight is Yule. That's the darkest hour, mm -hmm. and so it's just it, these are things that have always been part of the natural cycle. I think we're just sort of getting back to them because we're scared, and when we're scared, we go primal. I, I kind of wonder if there's something about taking it back as well, because when you look at the the timeline of Christmas, when it was pagan origin, Saturnalia, Yule, and then the religious folks come along, the church saying, OK, we can work with that. We'll piggyback on that. And then, OK, we'll we'll party that way. And then more religious folks come around and say, wait, no we're declaring war on Christmas as far as you're not allowed to have Christmas because it doesn't, it's not connected to the, to the birth of Christ. People are like, okay, well, it goes down for a while, but then they kind of still are celebrating it. And then over time it gets back to that religious state. And then now we're in the 21st century where there's another war on Christmas, but the culture war on Christmas is that, you're not celebrating it properly because you're not remembering Christ enough and we've taken Christ out of Christmas. So I kind of wonder, is this just the, the sort of cyclical nature where people are like, all right, screw it. We'll go back to the pagan ways and celebrate yeah. those again. Maybe, maybe that's, that's some pushback, you know, as, as, um, as people perceive other folks trying to push beliefs on them. Yeah. Um, also, too, I mean, I mean, I struggled with it, too, when I was a kid. I remember I had this uh, my my Jewish friend, Timmy. Right. Like I was like, oh, Santa's an anti-Semite. I had no idea. Right. Like, why doesn't he visit you? And um, of course, Santa does visit Jewish homes if that family wishes him to and, and can and can be purely secular. Absolutely. And should, by all means, put up a tree. Tree's not Christian. Right. Like, I mean, I. I Think so, and and that's that makes me sad too that there'd be Jewish or, or Hindu or Buddhist or any other family out there that says we can't put up a tree because we're not Christians. Guess what? <laughs> you know what I mean? You can. It was never Christian. Uh, by all means, if you like it, if you think it looks pretty, put one up. You know, uh, bake some cookies, have at it. You know, come come into the fold. It doesn't have to mean you're Christian. It never did. Uh, but anyway, so so yeah, maybe there's some pushback as we get a little more information on the origins of this stuff. And yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I th but I, I think that there re I really do believe in the collective consciousness of people. And you can't say the movie planted this seed into all of our heads. The movie wouldn't have come out if they didn't think people would go watch it. You know, so Krampus was already like the, the Krampus movie specifically. So like so Krampus was already bubbling up 
Hollywood cashed in on it, which f- further fueled the fire. And, you know, and now I think he's just here to stay. I saw an article the other day. Krampus is here to stay. And yeah. I, I agree. I think he's back for the long haul. It's it's so strange, though, the ways that it's reflected long before without any kind of conscious awareness of it. Like um, even prior to Krampus, we have gremlins that came out in the mid 80s, which those goblins are very much like the uh, the the Greek uh, Kalakansoxeroi or however you pronounce it. Or I yeah. forget you um you, you're uh, you focus on more of the um i think the uh turkish christmas goblins the uh the kronkolos i don't know oh karakonkolos yeah 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 Karakonkulos, i knew it yeah, wasn't yeah. the shapeshifter I knew, yeah i knew it wasn't cronut um but like yeah. in a way gremlins kind of channels that these guys coming in from the underworld they spread they wreak mischief and and stir up a, a, and they're just little you know hairy uh, bad guys roaming all around like bad elves yeah 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 and and they uh what i love about the karakonkalus is that he comes out they call it the unbaptized days and that's basically the 12 days of christmas like you know and which which, you know if you're a christian you think are like the holiest days or whatever but over there it's like no that's the most dangerous time the solstice just happened this this subterranean monster can come out and shapeshift and jump on your back and claw at you and scrape you until dawn when he has to go back underground uh it's it's a it's a powerful story and I, I, what i love about all these things is that they they resonate right the, they're around because we find some truth in it we find truth in krampus we found something sort of familiar about them he's literally in our dna even if you didn't grow up with him uh, outside of you know the the grinch um i think he's he's just entwined in our dna somewhere and this and and we're embracing him again and he's he's wait, he's been waiting he's been biding his time you know, and he's not alone. And there's others uh, over in Iceland. We, we talked about the Grilla too. You know, she's got this cauldron where she cooks the children in the pot. If you land at the Reykjavik airport right now in mm-hmm. mid-December, there's a giant pot with this ogre woman with a spoon in it. You're allowed to get into the pot and take pictures just like we do with mall Santa. How cool is that? You know, come on, America, we can do better. So anything that you weren't able to include in the book that, I don't know, maybe might appear in a volume two. Maybe, you know, so the reality is there's so many variations on Krampus, you know, and and I'm like, do I just keep listing them? Do I give them their own chapter? You know, all these like different spelling, but but just basically more or less the same creature by a different name. Um, So who knows what we might expand, but the book's doing really well, which is great. The publisher's already like excited for next year and, um, you know, it's, it's been an exciting time. So yeah. And what's cool too, is when you do something like this, you get emails and people come up to you and say, well, in my family, we, we heard, we had, we heard it this way and you go, oh, well, maybe that's worth including in in the future. So, um, you know, this, this whole book was born after years of giving talks in front of audiences and having people come up to me after going, I can't believe you didn't mention La Bafana, or I can't believe you didn't mention, you know, I'm like, why, geez, you know, how, how long do we have, you know? (laughs) So uh, and then you just you realize that every country has some little little unique version of it. Yeah, it's delightful. It's also a, a path to madness. I mean, like La Bafana, which actually is kind of cool because, you know, I grew up in Orlando and at Epcot during Christmas time, you go through the various world pavilions and they tell their their cultural Christmas stories. And that's when I first encountered La Bafana, even though I've got an Italian heritage. We didn't really ever talk about it, but the Italian Christmas witch. But the flip side of La Bafana that I heard was that, so, you know, as you write in the book, uh, <laughs> really obsessed with cleaning, really yeah. got to do a lot of sweeping um, and that she can't can't hang out with the wise men to go meet baby Jesus. As a result, the flip side is much darker that I heard that she was that she had a child and during King Herod's purge of the firstborns that her child was murdered. And then she kind of went mad with grief, looking for her baby, thinking everything was her baby. And she thought baby Jesus was her baby. And then he made her the uh, sort of the the mother of Christmas, the Christmas witch, um, and gave her a a bright path. I hadn't heard that one, but I I did. You know, there there was some acknowledgement that she's most likely based on a Roman goddess who is beautiful and alluring and you used to pull uh, branches down from the, the trees in her grove and you would ride through the village and you would, you know, do various things. But 
in Christianity, women can't be beautiful and alluring and powerful. They they have to be matronly or hag like, and then they're okay. They're safe, you know. Um, and so so yeah, th there's um, it, it's tough to trace the evolution of some of these things, but they do evolve. Uh, even Krampus, you know, I, I got to interview the the um, the curator of the Krampus Museum over in Austria, and he was talking about how the Krampus runs and Krampus parades are huge over there and just getting bigger because there's worldwide interest now. Krampus doesn't beat you and kill you anymore. So if you're standing on the sidelines of the parade, what they'll do is they'll run up and with their switch of sticks, they might like sort of tap you in the shins or the calves and to kind of like scare the bad spirits out of you. Uh, as So that's that's how they help is like a, a very mild beating, really. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, it's great. Krampus has to evolve with the times or he can't stick around. And so he has and will and does. And, you know, as will all the others. And some may go away like, like Zwarte Piet in, in the Netherlands. He might be gone. You know, it might be a few more years. And then they're just like, ah, we got to just stop this. It's Chimney Pete from now on or else. Yeah. So you well, never know. And your La Bafana. Yes. Uh, Strenia, was it? The, the, oh, right. right yeah. But this is a 1920 postcard that I'm displaying right now, which shows like a straight up vampish La Bafana uh, and is, I guess, still cleaning, but has <laughs> lots of dapper gentlemen in the background. So right, right. The, the imagery uh, emerges and evolves and then recycles through throughout time, which I, I just kind of love the the evolution and the recycling of all these things as it, it goes away, it comes back, it changes, as you said. Yeah, that's, now, that's what it always does. Yeah, and the, you, that, that, some of those okay. images, though, I just want to say, like, um, some of them, you know, we, we, we had arguments about some of them because I'm like, that's not really like what we're depicting in the in the text. But the argument was it's such a great postcard. Can we somehow fit it here? <laughs> you know, so sometimes that was those decisions were made on just the cool factor. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, but anyway, go on. Sorry. Well, no, I, for you, for this year, um, how are you going to be celebrating the creepy side of Christmas? Are you going to be making some uh, Tompton porridge? Are you going to be, <laughs> what do you, what, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, how, how do you celebrate it? So, uh, when after working on this, it really was cool to sort of like put up the the lights with intent, put up the tree with intent, kind of like, hey, I want these prickly pine needles to keep the bad spirits out. Um, I make my own wreath now for my front door. I'm not good at it, but I can tell you this. It is 100 percent effective. It does keep the bad spirits outside. It, it worked last year. It's working this year. And so um, so there's a, there's a few things like that. And I'm really trying to like focus on the intent of what I'm doing. I'm doing the same stuff I've always been doing, still buying gifts, wrapping presents, you know, and um, but, you know, we bake cookies and we make dinner for Christmas Eve and things like that. But I'm really trying to focus on the intent of it, that we are celebrating what we have, that we do give to charity. We, we give away our old stuff, you know, to make sure that those in need have something. And um, we 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 help others and we remind our family members that we love them. We're, we're getting to be the age, Aaron, as you know, where, you know, parents, you don't know how many Christmases are left. Um, if you're lucky enough to have grandparents, I don't might have been gone a while. Um, uncles and parents, it's each one you look at and you go, I wonder if this is our last Christmas. And that's that's a sort of different perspective, too. Yeah. And and really. Telling ghost stories and telling scary stories is a great way to bring community together. I mean, more sometimes more than just that meal or sharing in that the kind of the happy-go-lucky moments the scary stuff brings people together yeah of course it does and storytelling brings people yeah. together and i think that's another thing that's sort of happening is our culture is starting to appreciate the value of storytelling again i mean like you know the moth and story nights that are happening in like every city everywhere uh there's there's a real value to it and you realize the connection that happens when one person tells another person a story and if you can bring that tradition into your home, even if you're reading it out of a book, like Twas the Night Before Christmas, classic, right? But you, it's a moment. We always read it from the book mm -hmm. uh, growing up. And even that is sort of special. It's, we're not watching it on TV. We're not, you know, letting someone else uh, read it or tell it. We are telling it. And I think that really brings people together. I've seen stories bring people together all, all the year round, but when you really make it mean something and when it's your family and your friends, then it can be something truly special. And you're right. A ghost story just tickles the senses like, like nothing else. Um, it, it, that, that little bit of fear reminds you why we're here and that this is indeed a perfect setting for that fear. 
Well, I'll, I'm going to let you go, but I do. I, I am curious. I know you spent a lot of time at the um, the Omni Parker House Hotel, right? In Boston. Yeah, yeah. Uh, famed for Charles Dickinson, Ch- Dickens' live reading of A Christmas Carol there. Have you ever, I don't know if you have ever read A Christmas Carol on stage. If you have not, no. is, is that something you'd ever want to do? I have not. Um, you know, I've all, as a public speaker, I've, anytime I've ever had to read to an audience, like like a paragraph of something that I knew I was going to read to them, I've always began it with an apology. You know what I mean? I'm like, I don't like to read to people because you can read it, right? So, but I, I apologize. I want to get this right. Here's a paragraph. I don't know. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe make it a, a special podcast one time or whatever. Um, that story is just so powerful. There's There's theater companies that survive the whole year on that one story. They do really... Uh, innovative uh, plays that hardly sell any tickets in the summer because of the money they make off of, you know, selling tickets to that in, in December. Um, I know there's a, a performer around here does a one man uh, performance of the whole thing. Mm-hmm. He plays all the characters. Charles Dickens' grand, great grandson, I believe, um, is doing readings of it. I, I, I know I saw he was, you know, promoted somewhere nearby as he was going to read the whole book to audiences. I've never done it. I don't know if that calls to me. I kind of feel like that was his work, you know. Charles Dickens invented Christmas. I'm just I'm just trying to save it, you know. Yeah. Good tradition to carry on. I mean, the closest I've come is reading The Raven by Poe, which I guess is also a Christmas story, Weary Bleak December, right? Bleak December, absolutely. Yeah. So. For sure. And yeah, he knew. He knew that's the scariest month. Well, this does make a great gift for the season and Jeff, how can people pick up the book? Where can they pick it up? And how can they just support you in general? Yeah, well, um, so the book has sold out uh, at Amazon. It's sold out at books bookshop.org. Um, I know Barnes & Noble still has a few online copies, if that's how you want the hardcover. Um, it's, of course, av- available on Kindle. That won't run out. And the audiobook that I narrated, that won't run out either. So you can get that just about anywhere. But um, but no, I'm, I'm grateful. The support so far has been awesome. And I'm I, I love that it sort of resonates and can't wait to see what happens next year too. So thanks. Yeah, it really makes for, yes, I said a great gift, but also a great decoration that I'm going to be keeping around on the bookshelf and then on my coffee table during the seasons. Cause it's just such a delight to page through. So well, I've said too, like you leave this out on your coffee table and the kind of friends you don't want are going to go, Oh, what is that? I'm leaving. And that's perfect. Right. And, and people that are like, Ooh, what is that? I got to see this. Like, those are your people. You know what I mean? You can literally leave it out to attract those you want to attract and repel those you want to repel. Yeah, just if you're at a bar and you don't want to converse with someone, just start with, let me tell you about the Christmas cannibals. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, yeah. They're either your people or they're not. Yeah. (laughs) There's no gray area. There's no middle ground. Uh, Well, my guest is Jeff Belanger. Thank you, sir. I I very much appreciate your time. And the book is The Fright Before Christmas, Surviving Krampus and Other Yuletide Monsters. And it is available now. So go check it out. Download it. Pick it up. Go to a brick and mortar store all around you. I know you'll be able to find it. So thank you, Jeff. And I'm Aaron Sagers. And this has been Talking Strange. Until next time, be kind, stay spooky, keep it weird. And this holiday season, be merry.